What's going on, people? We are Tottenham TV back here for another match preview for the big, big top four clash at Villa Park. Villa sitting fourth, Spurs sitting fifth. Five points is the gap. Spurs do have a game in hand, though, albeit it is at Stamford Bridge. How are you feeling coming into this one, Sim? Look, it's a massive game. Um, biggest game of our season so far, uh, considering where both teams are in the league table. I think for me, a, a, a defeat would be disastrous. It would be fairly catastrophic in the league rankings. I think if we can get a draw, it wouldn't be a great result, but I think it would be a result that just keeps us in the hunt for that top four, considering the games that Villa have coming up. Um, and a win would be marvellous. So I think a lot is riding on this game. I think Aston Villa, obviously, for a lot of this season, have been very, very good at Villa Park. But... There have been some recent hiccups uh, in recent weeks at the, at the at home, so they're definitely not infallible recently. I, I definitely go into this game um, with the feeling that if they play they how they've been playing recently at home, we can definitely go there and get a result uh, for sure. But Villa will be feeling the same about us. They'll mm. be probably feeling how we've been playing recently. There's, they've got nothing to fear with us coming up uh, to coming to Villa Park, where they've beaten Man City and Arsenal, uh, um, you know, in December. So they're going to be coming into this game with no fear as well. I think it's set to be a game where both teams really believing they can win. And I don't think I think a draw doesn't really help either team in a way. So I feel like both teams won't want to draw in this game mm. but you were saying before the game a couple of days ago that you would take a draw i would take a draw but i don't think the team will i don't mm. think spurs will. oh yeah uh, I, I think spurs are gonna um go for the win uh we know how Ange likes to how likes to do things and we know he at the end of the day we are five points behind and i don't think spurs will want that to continue and if any chance to cut the gap will be beneficial so I do think Tottenham if for example going to the last 10 minutes if the games are 1-1 I don't think we settle for the draw I think we go for the win but if you're asking me now would I take a draw given the fact how disastrous a defeat would be I probably would mm. um, there's a couple of storylines um, in the build up to this game obviously it's the top four race massive clash in that but then if you cast your mind back to the game earlier on the season when Aston Villa did beat us at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium there's a story about Ben Tancor and Matty Cash there's been a lot made out of the Romero death stare to Matty Cash. And also in that game, you know, we could have been 3 4 nil up in the first 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and um, Villa came back and beat us, which probably we deserve to win that game. So there is a lot of storylines kind of coming into this game. I do think we owe them um, a bit of a beating. We haven't beaten them in a while. I think it's three games in a row since we have beaten Aston Villa. Um, but before we get into the head to heads and stuff like that, let's look at the form of the two teams coming into it. You mentioned Villa's home form haven't been as great as earlier on the season when they went a number of games. How many games was it in a row? I think um, they won 17 over from 12 months or something. Over 12 months, which was a ridiculous record. And, and as you say, actually kind of ended after they beat Man City and Arsenal in consecutive games, um, funnily enough. And the next yeah. game after that, they drew it home to Sheffield United. So that was kind of the peak of their home form at that and point. That that Man City game was something like I've never seen before. I don't think I've ever seen a team dominate Man City from start to finish like Aston Villa did that day, but they haven't been able to replicate that kind of performance ever since then. The performances at Villa Park since then, or since the Arsenal game, um, haven't been great. I mean, they've won, I think, one, once or twice in their last six games at Villa Park. Um, what do you think that's down to? Is it down to purely just down to injuries? No, I don't think it's purely just down to injuries. I think... Part of it is, obvious, of course, but I do think um, there was a general overperformance in Aston Villa in those 12 months. I think it was going to be very, very difficult to keep that up um, over a, a sustained period of time, especially after you get those headline wins against Man City and against um, Arsenal. People are going to take you a lot more seriously at Villa Park, and that's what we saw. I do think in some games they were unlucky, like I thought the Sheffield United game at home, they were very unlucky in that game. But I think... Um, the high line was maybe found out a tad. People came with plans uh, to kind of stop it. And that was, um, you know, it was getting found out a bit. And um, I think Aston Villa rely very much on um, uh, playing very intensely. And as well, uh, they started to fall behind in a few a few games. You know, that Chelsea game, the Newcastle game, the Man United game. And I feel like um, they're not as good when falling behind. They're, much, they're better when taking the lead, albeit... They have given away a few leads as well, but I do think they're better when when they're scoring the first goal. So um, I feel like with Aston Villa, there's a combination of issues that led to their home form not being as good as it has been previously. But 
Um, I do feel like they're going to be well up for this game. They know how important it is. Um, I feel like in recent weeks, maybe they've had they've been going on a good cushion in that top four, maybe even chasing and stuff like that. But this game is so imperative. And I feel like as well, Unai Emery's team selection on Thursday was a, maybe an inkling that he's actually prioritising this game on Sunday. Yeah, which was a surprise to all of us because we were coming into this game thinking, all right, they've got European football sandwiched, uh, in, you know, Tottenham in between uh, two European games, two big European games against Ajax. And history tells us that Unai Emre usually prioritises the cup competitions or the European competitions. But in actual fact, it seems to be the opposite this week with him prioritising this Tottenham game over the European games. Pau Torres uh, came back yesterday and this bad form that they have had at home does kind of coincide with Pau Torres's um, absence from the team, doesn't it? Yeah, and he's been absolutely brilliant for them at left centre back. He's um, a player, obviously, Tottenham have been looking at very closely for the last couple of years and heavily linked with. And a player that I think in general we were quite positive about the prospect of bringing him in. Um, uh, obviously, they got him for what, 40 million at the end of the day, something like that. A pretty good price for a player who Unai Emery knew well from his days at Villarreal. Um, obviously, it was imperative to Villarreal's run to that Champions League semi final a couple of years ago, where I thought he was absolutely brilliant in that run. And I think he's. Had, he had a little sticky start to life in the Premier League. Yeah. I remember he made his debut in that 5-1 defeat to, New, to Newcastle first day of the season. But has learned from that, I feel, and has really gone from strength to strength. And has actually become that centre-back we all thought would really improve Tottenham when uh, when we were linked with him. That ball-playing centre-back with incredible ability and composure on the ball to pick out passes. Um, and also, he's proven not to be, not to have been this slow liability um, in that high line, which they've been playing uh, with regularity this season. He's not really been exposed. And that was one of the big things that a lot of uh, Spurs fans were worried about, about the prospect of signing him. Oh, is he too slow for the Premier League? Will he be caught out over the top? Well, he hasn't been for Aston Villa. And I think he's proven to be one of the signings of the season for them and for a brilliant price as well. So it's no surprise when that when you replace him and you know your placement is long lay, there's a there's a big drop off there. And you know, you look at that massive run that they had at home. Uh, like we said, it has been a drop off. Aston uh, Newcastle at home, no Pal Torres, they lose the game 3-1. Chelsea at home, no Pau Torres, they lose the game 3-1. Manchester United at home, no Pau Torres, they lose the game 2-1. Um, and then Aston Villa, he played the first 45 minutes. Aston Villa were brilliant in that first 45 minutes. Forest. Forest. Sorry, Forest, yeah. Uh, they played Forest. First 45 minutes, they were absolutely brilliant. And then second half, he goes off because I think he only planned to play 45 minutes that game. And they had a massive drop off. Mm -hmm. So I think he's absolutely vital and key to the way they play. He got 45 minutes on Thursday night against Ajax. So I think that's probably in line with him starting this game. Yeah, for sure. And considering Emery said he planned to take him off um, at half time, So that shows me that Emery uh, has definitely been managing him. And I think it's all in, in, I think he knows how crucial this game is. And I think he's been managing him over the last few weeks in court, in, in line. So you can have a him for 90 minutes in this game on Sunday. And now that's a big, big boost for Aston Villa if he's going to do that. And as well, it looks like he's been trialing a few things um, recently uh, in terms of formation, player selection. Uh, on Thursday, he played Esri Konsa at right back um, and in, in a view of like making it kind of a hybrid back three system. Are we going to see that? Um, uh, going forward, maybe on Sunday, he's maybe he's seen that Tottenham have struggled um, on, a, on recent occasions against teams in a back three. Is he going to experiment with that as well? So definitely a lot of things to consider going into Sunday. Um, but also a lot of things to be positive about as well from Tottenham's point of view. Yeah, uh, let's look at the head-to-head -head between the two clubs. Last three games have been shocking. We've lost three in a row against them. But before that, we hadn't lost at Villa Park since 2008. Yes, they had been in the championship um, once or twice, I think, in that time. But from a team that we have had such a good record against, these last three games have been a bit shocking, haven't they? Well, last game we should have won. We all know that last season, obviously they did double over us. Um, the one at the lane, I remember, was a really poor performance. I remember Lor Loris Howler gave them the first goal. Under Mason, remember. wasn't it? The, th the, the one in the May one was. In May, yeah. The one in May was. The one in January was under Conte. The one in May, I remember we... Um, I remember we actually played quite well when we were unlucky to lose as well, but we, you know, we were two 0 down and we kind of mounted a comeback too little, too late. But I think Villa have definitely had the upper hand in in recent weeks. But it's interesting. I think 
the stats read they've won four of the last six games against us but before that they had only won one game in 17 mm. which is a r- r- bit ridiculous so i think the history of this fixture is tottenham have had the upper hand massively it's one of those uh just fixtures where we always seem to get a positive result i've got a lot of good memories of tottenham going to villa park and getting wins but everyone remembers that sonny goal in the last minute when he had that broken arm yeah that was that one obviously uh the sonny hat trick as well mm. uh, that, that's on screen uh a couple of years ago i remember bale scoring a hat trick of Villa Park as well uh, in when Spurs won 4-0 so a lot of good memories of Villa Park but it's a it's a definitely a different kind of place now than it was you know maybe 10 years ago absolutely and um, you know if you would have said to a Villa fan three years ago you'd be fighting against Tottenham for the top four they would have absolutely laughed you out the room uh, and look at them now they are absolutely flying this season and when you're looking at Spurs coming into this game, Ange has done his press conference, Pedro Porro back into the side, no other fresh injury concerns, but Richarlison won't make it all, be it he did say after the last game that he's been training and he's going to make it for the next game. Um, but in terms of Pedro Porro, what a massive plus that is going into this one. Yeah, big boost. Uh, we know his passing ability is so crucial to how Spurs want to play. Um, it's a weird one with uh, their... Um, the way Villa play, they usually play a wide midfielder on the right and a tucked in midfielder on the left hand side, whether it be sometimes McGinn or maybe a Jacob Ramsey. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how they kind of um, move forward with this on uh, on Sunday. But if, if they do do that, then I wonder if, if they'll be to Pedro Porro's benefit or to his detriment. Will that give him extra attention? Will, will that midfielder maybe playing a bit more century for Villa mean there's less space for Porro? Or will Porro be able to find a bit more space if he moves out wide and all of a sudden maybe he can um, kind of get into the end a bit more? And as well, from a defensive point of view, I do I, I do wonder whether it's beneficial or not. I think it's going to be an interesting tactical flashpoint um, in the game because of how Villa operate. Um, but obviously having Pedro Porro, especially with his passing ability against Villa's high line, could be a massive asset to us because if anyone's going to pick out a pass, you know, a perfectly timed run to a Werner or a, a Sonny, you know, Porro is one of the few players in our team who are capable of doing that. So yeah. uh, it's good. It's a massive plus having him back. Yeah, obviously alongside James Madison as well. And I feel like Spurs did have a much better performance last week against um, Crystal Palace at home, albeit still lacked that constant chance creation that maybe we had in the first 10 games of the season. What can we do to maybe get back to that? And maybe is Villa a potentially a good test for that with potentially their high line? Or do you feel like Unai Emre will have a plan for Tottenham this weekend and not put, push that line up so high? I'm sure he'll have a plan, but I don't think the plan will be to retreat. I think he's going to go and try and win the game. He's going to try and put it on us. I think he'll probably try and do what they did to Man City, you know, back in uh, December, which was ultra uh, aggressive. Yeah. They had, There was so much energy. I've never seen such a relentless team in my life in that game. Uh, literally Man City, you know, a team known for being able to play out the back, play, keep possession, play through the lines. They just had no answer to how aggressive Aston Villa were. Aston Villa were literally going man for man the whole game. And I don't know whether it was an off night for Man City. He probably was a bit of an off night, but just the way Villa intensely pressed them and pressed them into oblivion and were able to just turn the ball over so consistently time after time. That is what I think they're going to try and do to us because I do think recently... Uh, we've played against teams who maybe sit back a bit. You've got your Wolves, Brentford, you've got um, uh, who else? Everton, teams who are maybe a bit more transitional, like to, I mean, Villa can be transitional as well, but uh, <clears throat> teams who like to sit back a bit, play compact, like to stop the opposition in a deep block, restrict them from playing football. I think Villa are going to play, in a, they're going to throw a bit more risk to the game because they're at home. They know what they're capable of at home. So I don't think they're going to have a plan to kind of, change the way they're attacking but I do think they're going to be ultra aggressive and I do think there will be some risk but knowing Una Emre he might have a trick or two up his sleeve in terms of maybe a tactical switch or a change going into this game uh, if he's I think I think if he's smart he does drop the line a bit deeper because I think if you just don't give Sonny that space then I think that's one massive attack in our armory being restricted and that's something we nearly took advantage of really well in the game at Villa at uh, uh, the Tottenham Stadium last last time out the amount of times we exploited that high line was was so many they're just lucky that on the, uh, that foot on a couple of things you know one that our finishing was completely off and as well that Sonny for on three occasions was was millimeters offside when is when he had his shooting boots on so is that sustainable 
in this game if we create the same level of, tra level of chances I don't know yeah and I do kind of feel like this game will be like a bit of a basket ma basketball match at times where there'll be a m crazy amounts of chance at both ends and with us having Sonny them having Watkins you've got two of the star strikers in the Premier League going head to head this mm -hmm. weekend and I won't say it's a blessing in disguise because I think that's a bit disrespectful for Richarlison but I think it's so much more of a plus to have Young min Son leading the line in that number nine today, uh, this weekend than a Richarlison because you know you need to be so clinical this weekend to take our chances and what a better man than the, probably the most clinical striker in the Premier League in Young min Son. Yeah and I thought he had a really good game against um, Palace as well obviously got on the score sheet and again showing exactly what he can do when he's running, running in one-on-one uh, -on -one in behind in those kind of situations and I think Villa, a lot of the time, I was, I was even seeing some of the highlights against uh, Ajax and that a few times they played that high line and Ajax were able to get in behind but they mm. didn't have a finisher like Human Son who was so clinical in those kind of situations. And uh, actually, those kind of situations, are, uh, it's not easy to find a striker as good as Sonny who not only has the pace to, <clears throat> to run in behind but has that composure to finish nine times out of ten as well. It's very, very difficult to find those and Sonny's going to be one of the players they'll come up against who's just perfect for pointing that. And there's not that many strikers in the league who are. I mean, you could also argue Haaland is one of them and they, they were able to keep him quiet. So they'll feel confident they'll, they will be able to keep Sonny quiet as well. But it's about engineering the, the opportunities to play him in on goal. And that's what they restricted at Man City from doing in their game. And we've just got to make sure that we don't get bullied in this game. So if we get bullied and we don't, if then they don't, don't allow us to kind of play our football and they're going to be very intense in their pressing, it's going to be very easy to engineer those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Very hard, sorry, to engineer those opportunities. And that's what we've got to prevent. We've got to make sure we match their aggression and match their intensity off the ball. And if we do that and we get a foothold in the game, there will be openings for us. And in terms of Ollie Watkins, what a season he's having. I think it's 26 goal contributions this year, 16 goals, 10 assists, I think uh, is the numbers. How the hell do we keep him quiet over the weekend? Because you've got him and the link up he has with Leon Bailey as well, which I think is nothing short of spectacular this season. Leon Bailey's just come on leaps and bounds to what he showed last season. And Ollie Watkins got that aerial threat. And we don't particularly have the centre-backs that, um, that can maybe uh, be as good as him in the air. Yeah, and that's what gives Watkins so many advantages actually you look at the game at the Tottenham Stadium he was hurting us in so many different ways I remember he scored a header which was ruled out for offside just after we um, went and took the lead and so he has that kind of aerial threat but he also has that running in behind threat which is how he got that um that the winner uh, of the game at the Tottenham Stadium and again you saw that at Luton exa a perfect example first goal was a header and the second goal he ran in behind and caught the opposition off guard and was able to finish so coolly so that is what's making Watkins so effective but then not only do you have those kind of two threats which he has which is running in behind and his aerial ability but his hold up play is also exceptional which is, which is why he has 10 assists this season um, he has got brilliant hold up play and he's got he's actually really good when he's um, when he run, makes his runs out wide and does his cut backs into the penalty box uh, he is so so difficult to deal with and I do envisage Tottenham having difficulty dealing with him if we allow um, Villa to get supply to him if, they, if we allow Villa time on the ball and allow him allow them passes to pick out Watkins whether it be running in behind whether he crosses out wide whether it be when he peels out wide and they find that space in behind the inverted fullback um, it's going to be so difficult to stop him and at the end of the day how very few teams have been able to stop him this season. That's that's how good he's been. Yeah. So I don't I would I wouldn't be surprised if Watkins does get some joy against us. But I think the the goal would be just restricting the amount of times they get the ball to him. I don't think the goal can be never allow the ball to Watkins because that's I mean obviously they were going to try and do that but it's not possible because they'll get the ball to him a few times but as long as we can restrict him to one or two opportunities rather than you know uh, the opportunities we've been given to giving to strikers in recent weeks that would be how we can kind of just restrict Villa as much as possible but he's an absolute handful absolute handful when you know some people are saying shouts for player of the year yeah and um, he's definitely within the running that's for sure um, 100 percent a player that we know very well, Clement Longley, uh, returning against Spurs this weekend at, at Villa Park. Do you feel like he's a player that we can really target this weekend? Yeah, I hope so. I think Sonny will know him well, uh, obviously having played with him. And I think he's definitely, I look at that back line, it depends if he starts, obviously on the in midweek against Ajax, they played concert right back. They played Longley and Pau Torres with, um, I think it was Moreno or Dinia on the left. Um, 
and uh, we were just talking to Dan Bardell off, off uh, which your video will be out later, and he was saying how it's kind of a hybrid. On the ball, they were moved into a back three, so Longley played in in the central centre back role with Powell Torres on the left and Conte on the right, and then on the uh, and then off the ball, it went to a back four with Conte moving right back, and then Longley moving right centre back. Um, if they do uh, have that, if you, I just know how Sonny likes to play. And Sonny likes that inside channel between the the right back and, and the uh, and the left centre back. He likes making that run, so when he gets the ball, he can finish into the far corner. And if Longley is going to be moved playing at right centre back when they're off the ball, and we can get a quick transition, I think that area there is definitely something Sonny can can be getting joy out of. I think that's definitely something he'll be he'll be targeting. However, uh, Diego Carlos is fit. So whether he start maybe he starts at the right centre back with Paul Torres, that's also a case. Maybe they even could even go Conza right centre back with Torres and uh, Matty Cash coming in at right back. So there's no guarantees Longley plays, considering their their players are coming back from injury now. So I think if Longley does play, that's definitely an avenue we can target. But there's no guarantee he plays. Yeah, he did say that um, he's pleasantly surprised with uh, Clement Longley and happy with Longley at the moment, which I which I was very surprised about because every time I've seen him play, he looks like the weak point in their back line. And he said that even Longley has played him himself over Diego Carlos in the pecking order, which again, I was surprised about. Um, another narrative in this game, which um, I alluded to at the beginning of the preview was the Matty Cash situation. Obviously, we all know what happened at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium earlier this season. We know what happened a couple of years back with Matt Doherty. Um, obviously, earlier on the season was, was with Rodrigo Bentancourt. Rodrigo Bentancourt most likely could be playing this weekend with Pat Matesar still nursing that back injury. We all saw that death stare from Romero as well. Do you feel like it's important for the Spurs players not to get dragged into that situation? Yeah, I would say so, because if you remember against, Bright, uh, not, uh, against Brentford, we were very distracted in that first half. More pie was getting under our players' skin. We were getting too involved with things that weren't related to being good in the football match, essentially. We were getting too much distracted by more pie's antics, and it led to us being a bit very disjointed on the pitch. And uh, we went into half time 1 0 down. And obviously, we turned it around in the second half. And maybe in that second half, actually, we used that anger in a positive way, and we, f- we used it to fuel ourselves and, uh, you know, uh, to hit back at them. But in that first half, it, ne- it, it affected us in a negative way. So. I don't know if they're going to be the players are going to be going to this game as much as the fans are, you know, th- focused on this whole Matty Cash subplot. I do think if some players get an opportunity to, they might take a swipe at him, uh, and and I just hope they don't go do it overzealously because you know we can't afford to go down to ten men in this game. But I hope it doesn't become a distraction. I don't think it will. I think these players, I think Ange as well, will be wary of it, and I think he'll know that these players to keep them on on task and on job but I wouldn't be surprised if given the opportunity uh you know going in for a 50-50 someone you know has takes the opportunity just to go in a bit uh, extra with a bit of extra aggression would you take um let's say we're winning the game 3-0 and Romero has the opportunity to absolutely clatter Matty Cash <laughs> in the end of the game would you take a red card no. uh for the last game and get Dragoose in a, a game next week I wouldn't know. <laughs> Unless it's uh, maybe what I'm, I'll, you know what I'd do if it was a um, last man red card where he only misses one game. Okay, maybe I'll take it. <laughs> I'm not taking a three game suspension though. No, I, I agree with the three game. But if it's just a, a nice one game Who suspension, get get a Fulham away. Okay, one game. <laughs> as long as it's Matt Cash. <laughs> <laughs> Only Matt Cash. Um, yeah, so look, it's going to be a mad game this weekend. I think there's going to be a lot of goals in it, to be honest. And um, I can't call which way this is going to go. I think this could go either way quite easily. And, you know, both, like you said, mentioned before, both teams are going to really fancy their chances coming up against each other. I think both teams are well within their right to fancy their chances as well. But when you read the narratives of the game which way do you think it's going to go and what's your score prediction yeah when I've been thinking about this game previously like the whole week you know I've been thinking you know Villa having the European game that's going to affect how intense they can be but then you've looked at their team and they that they did play on um, sorry Thursday and it was a quite a well it was quite a well rested team I think they made six changes from the weekend so it was a fairly well rested team and then they usually play so that would uh, show me that they're prioritising the, the Sunday game. That does change my thinking a bit in terms of what kind of Villa will be facing. But on the flip side of that, 
it's still an away European game. You still got to add in the travel time. That does take a toll. Tottenham have had a fresh week just to deal with this game. You know, we've probably been planning this game for the last week and they've had to basically been planning for the Ajax game for a lot of it and then turn their attention to Spurs only today, essentially, in terms of training and stuff. That also takes its toll. I've definitely seen teams um put in lackluster performances after european games even after they've made changes even after they've yeah. rested players they, you expect them to come in fully f- firing because they've made changes and yet for some one reason or other it's still lackluster because all these other elements still take its toll on the team and still putting their main players watkins still, still started louise still started so th- that that all can take its toll i think how i envisage the game going i think because of that Villa are going to want to try and come real frying out the traps early. They're going to try and want to hit us early. And they're going to, because I, I think they're going to try and win the game essentially in the first half. I think that's what they've tried to do in a few games this season. Um, and I think they're going to literally put everything into that first half, trying to get into the lead. They might score a goal or two, um, hopefully not two, maybe, but hopefully a goal. Maybe they'll get a goal in the first half. But I, well, how I envisage things going, I do see Tottenham um, being under the cost a bit early on. But I also see us maybe getting a foothold in the game. And once we grow into the game, if we if we go into what I'm going to say is I'm going to predict if we go into the half time, either only losing by a goal or drawing, I think we've got a very good chance of winning. If we go into the half time losing by two 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 goals or more, then I think we might give ourselves too much to do. Unfortunately, and that's not a position we want to give um, Aston Villa going going into this game. I reckon we go into half time like one all. And then second half, I think Villa might run out of energy and we might take advantage of that. So I'm going to predict... I said 3-1 in my predictions. I don't think it will be 3-1 because I'm looking at that team now. But I'm going to go for 2-1 Spurs. I think we're going to sneak it. I think Villa will run out of energy. I've seen them tire in second halves as well. um, And that's not even in European games. So I'm going to go with 2-1 Spurs and a big victory for us. So you're going for me to get the five-pointer this weekend? Unfortunately, yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I think there's going to be more goals in it, to be honest. I'm looking at this game and I think the narrative of the the Son v Watkins situation, the high lines that both teams play, I think there's going to be so many chances at both ends. I really hope Spurs are the team that come out firing from off the uh, the traps this weekend because we haven't seen that in such a long time with Spurs. And in, in such a big game, I think it's important and imperative that we start the game strong. But I do kind of agree with you. I think Villa are the ones that are going to start the game stronger. I do think we're going to probably go 1-0 down in the game. But I think we've got it well within us and with the clinical edge that we have with Jung Min Son up front. I've got a feeling that we're going to take the game 3-2. And what's what's positive as well is that recently, obviously, we've been used to going 1-0 down. So hopefully if we do go 1-0 down in this game, we don't panic We don't in the situation. We don't like rush anything. Mm. And we kind of just take the lessons we've learned from recent weeks where I think, what, the last four or five games we've gone 1-0 down uh, apart from the Everton game. I think in every other game, we've gone 1-0 down and we were able to overcome that. And um, apart from the Wolves game, end up you know, getting back in the game and winning. So hopefully we've learned those lessons and if we do end up you know conceding first in this game we don't panic and we just keep believing that if we can stay in the game we'll end up uh you know getting getting all three points and we've done that as well we did it at the emirates you know we we went behind and stayed calm got points we did it at the etihad i remember i know i think we went behind in the first half 2-1 end up getting a point there so I believe, I do believe we'll go 1 0 down, but I believe we'll turn it around. And there's a lot to be said as well um, about the two clubs that are going head to head with Aston Villa. They've not really been in this situation before, uh, fighting for a top four. Spurs have been there, done it many times now, and um, come over the line many times as well in these big games. You cast your mind back a couple of years ago, you know, Arsenal at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, where it was a massive top four clash uh, many years ago, the Band City game, and there have been other games in there uh, between then as well. So I think the experience will. Uh, uh, stand in good stead as well this weekend. How do you feel in terms of the the these two teams, right? Maybe apart from since before uh, Martin Yell took over, maybe before Re- maybe before Redknapp was in charge when Tottenham got that Champions League football. They're all very similarly situated, mm. weren't they? Very similar sized clubs, very both clubs as well in terms of trophies. Historically, won a lot, but recently not so much. Mm. Villa, you know, for the last decade or so, have been in the wilderness, like you know absolutely nowhere but it wasn't that long ago remember under under martin o'neill they were challenging us for top four they were quite a good team now they're kind of back up there like for you like do you feel like if villa finish above us this season that really puts them like back in that conversation of like 
you know, challenging that top six now as being a big six club? Or do you still feel like they've got a lot more work to do to get into that conversation? I think they're, they're in, I think they're in the conversation. I think they've proved it this year to be in the conversation. I think Unai Emre was, um, was a clever addition, a clever managerial appointment for them. And I think um, since all that money was pumped in um, before Steven Gerrard uh, joined the club, Steven, Steven Gerrard was a bad appointment, but I think the club was still progressing in a positive way. It was a bad managerial appointment, but they were making good additions to the squad. And I feel like once sacking Stevie G, bringing in Unai Emre, uh, that really solidified the them to go uh, of them going in the right direction and I think um, when you're looking at them in comparison to maybe a Newcastle I feel like I feel like they're ahead of Newcastle in terms of the de- development even though Newcastle got Champions League football looking at the way they're going this season I, I kind of put them on the same level as a Newcastle to be honest and, and you're looking at the way the clubs are progressing I still put Tottenham a bit ahead of them though only a bit? A bit, yeah. Well, you know, this, you're talking about a team who's never played Champions League football before. I know that, but you're looking at... Oh, well, they, are they, did they do it in the 90s, maybe? I don't, maybe they did in the 90s, but definitely not since then. But you've got to look at the way they're playing this season and the progression that they've made. You know, Spurs finished eighth last season. Yeah, but Una Emery has a a um, a history of, you know, doing it over a short period. But is this going to be a long-term thing? Like, do you know, do they need to, is this a moment for them to really capitalise on or is it going to be a flash in the pan? I think it is. I think it is going to be a long-term thing. And I actually think they're here to maybe not stay forever, but definitely for the foreseeable future. They've pumped a lot of money in uh, since the new owners have come in. And um, similar to Newcastle, maybe not to the extent of the uh, riches that Newcastle have, but I feel like because of the money that they've pumped in, the players that they've brought in, they are going in the right direction massively. And look, I don't think they are on the same level of Spurs in terms of stature, especially when you look at what Spurs have done over the last 10, 15 years, whatever it may be. But I do feel that they're creeping up. Mm. Yeah, I do. I do wonder whether they're going to be consistent top six, you know, challenging for the top six, you know, year in, year out now. Or is this going to be just like, you know, how some I remember Everton had that period where the, you know, under Moyes where they were. I think it's different where they were challenging top five fairly consistently and then yeah. they dropped they have had a massive drop off. I mean, what makes it different, though? the investment that that villa have put in everton didn't really but have that investment with FFP now so yeah look that that's 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 a that's a different situation to talk yeah. about but i think right now when you're looking at their squad um not exactly an old aging squad no. um i think they've got really good players there and if they can keep adding to that i know they got the ffp situation um but if they're forced to sell then obviously that changes the narrative mm. but right now if they can keep adding to what they have i think they're onto a really good thing i do not agree I, obviously, I agree they're doing fantastically. I'm just not convinced. I'm not. I, I, look, don't get me wrong. Villa are doing brilliant. They're having a great season. Um, oh, this is off the back. Of, this is not just like this is off the back of an unbelievable second half of last season as well. You got to remember when Uma 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 took over. I think they were what in in a relegation battle. They were 16th, I believe, and he dragged them to seventh place. You know, with, with I think if you just just isolated. The results of Villa just after Emery took over, I believe they were third in the league or something like that. Ridiculous. They were brilliant, but I don't know. I'm st- I'm, I'm looking at their team, and I think there's been an overperformance by a few players this season, which I don't know how sustainable it is. Not 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 necessarily Watkins, but a lot of the midfielders are chipping in with a lot of goals. How sustainable that is. People like Bailey, how sustainable is his form this season? I know he's a good player, but is he a player who's going to be able to perform like that year in, year out? Kind but of I thing? think last year with Bailey was a massive underperformance. Yes, but that was like a couple of years of underperformance, if you know what I mean. Well, what, was last year not his first year? I think... Maybe I I'm, thought last year was his first season. Maybe, at maybe you're right. Maybe uh, is last year's. Maybe you're right. Um, but yeah, last year was. Yeah, it was an underperformance from him. Because in the Bundesliga, he was smashing it. But he was good. Before that. He was good. He was again known as an inconsistent player, but he was good. Um, I don't know. I think they're heavily relying on him and Watkins right now. Louise has chipped in with a lot of goals, like he a lot more goals than than he usually chips in with. Like people like McGinn have been chipping in with goals and stuff like that. I think they're a good team, but. I'm not looking at that team and thinking that team is going to challenge the top six year in year out. I think they need to to really progress. There's going to need like some major investment this is in the third summer. Season. Third, yeah, so yeah. yeah, it is the third season. So I think they're going to need like major investment in the summer. I think they're probably going to need a lot more than Tottenham. I'm, I'm just looking at Tottenham. I think they're a younger team. I think there's there's high potential with Spurs even with oh, that. I don't disagree. And so. I, and I think as well, like I wouldn't be surprised if teams like Chelsea, Newcastle, 
are back above Villa next season. I wouldn't be surprised about but that. But I still think they'll be in the conversation, though. But That's what I'm saying. I don't know. I think they need I think they need to really capitalise on finishing the top four this season. I think that's so important for them. If they drop in back into Europa League next season, I don't know. I feel like that, that would be really demoralising considering the year they've had. And I feel like this is more like a moment they need to really take advantage of. And I feel like if they don't, then I feel like they might... Um, start regressing again. It depends who they lose this summer, in my opinion, because there's been a lot of talk about Douglas Luiz, the amount he's come on this season. I think it's been nothing short of spectacular. They've brought in Yuri Tielemans, kind of reinvigorated his career as well, who I think is mm. having a really good season. Watkins, um, Bailey, Consa, who I think is a really good defender. Pau Torres, um, who's come in and hit the ground running after a few dodgy starts. I mean, They've got some really good players there. And if they can keep adding to that, I don't see a reason why they can't um, stick around in the conversation for maybe the top six spaces. I think top four consistently might be a bit too much to ask, but top six, I, I don't see a reason why not. And you've also got to look at the Moussa Diaby um, as well. I think he's had, you know, he's been a bit of a letdown. Maybe not a letdown, but not reached the heights Definitely, that maybe... Def you know, he had a great start. And then yeah, but he hasn't reached the heights that maybe what people thought when he first came in mm. uh, throughout the whole, whole course of the season. But I also envisage him to have a much stronger season next year after another after a year behind him in the Premier League. So they've actually got really good players there. Um, but I just feel like they need to add to that because outside the first 11, maybe they are a bit short. Yeah, and I'm not. I don't know if they will like like to the level they need to. That's, that's what mm. I feel. And I, as much as I love Unai Emery... I, like you? and uh, as a manager I think he's a great manager I should say don't love him like <laughs> I, I don't think I don't love him that way but I, I think I think he's a great manager I think he's had such a great career um I do generally think he is more of a of a cup manager generally that's how he usually um is he proving that wrong this season maybe maybe he is but we I need more than a season to mm. kind of ascertain that where did he they finish well. last year was it seventh they finished seventh yeah. and they're improving on that this season to be fair I don't know uh but in terms of like them putting themselves in the conversation of like being a bigger club than Tottenham, like what do, what do they need to do? Oh, you? bigger club than Tottenham. They need to do a lot to be a bigger a club lot. than Tottenham. Not just one season. No, one Tottenham. season doesn't make you a big club than Tottenham. Albeit they finished above us last season. Um, they might even That's finish true. above us this season. Mm. What would you say? They finished above us two years in a row. Mm. Um, I still think that Tottenham are a bigger club than, than Aston Villa, even if they finish above us again this season. I feel like the future looks a lot more brighter at Tottenham than at Aston mm. Villa. Um, we've got Ange Postecoglou at the helm, progressive football, um, the stadium, the money that we can bring in, spend uh, through that. We're nowhere near the FFP borderline and they are. So I think that when you're looking at the futures and the trajectories of the two clubs, I, feel, I still feel Tottenham as much as we finished below them last season and potentially again this season. Um, it's been a letdown, but I still feel the trajectories of the two clubs. I think Spurs could potentially go and fight for the league title over the next couple of years. I think Villa's ceiling's probably top four at best. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, I just find it interesting because, you know, not so long ago they were maybe on the same level, but obviously the trajectories of both clubs have gone in wildly different directions over the last, you know, decade or so. And now... It's it's tough for but if you're a Villa fan, isn't Tottenham like that? You feel like that's what that's your competition, right? Tottenham you is the like, benchmark, I think, what they're looking mm, at uh, you, right now. Yeah, but you feel like like that's the next progression, isn't it? Like you want that's, to fight against yeah, Tottenham. That's where like, I mean, that's you that's where they're at right now. They finished above us last season by a space. There is they're five points above us right now on the league table. Mm. So their their fans would be saying, well, we're already on that level. Mm. But look, that is our match preview. We kind of diverted there a bit of a uh, debate about Aston Villa. But let us know in the comment section below. What are your thoughts? Do you feel like Tottenham and Aston Villa are on the same level playing field at the moment? Uh, let us know in the comment section below. But let's get on to the... Actually, just before we do that, let's go for a few super chats. We've got two members chats. One from Amir, member for 35 months. Go big on, up, Amir. Amir. He says, big up, everyone. Good luck to our under-21s in a huge derby tonight. It's time for revenge against Aston Villa. 3-2 to Spurs. Come on, you Spurs. And I'll be there tonight at the um, under-21s at Borenwood. Very much looking forward to it. And there was actually one question I was going to ask you uh, before we ended the preview was about uh, Matty Cash. Again, Like, how, are you excited to be uh, in the same stadium and booing him on the weekend? Am I excited to be <laughs> yeah. in the same stadium? Is that a little Booing rat? him. Um, course. Of course I am. Can't wait. I'm actually gutted that I'm not going to be able to go to Villa Park this weekend. But... Uh, 
Um, I hope when you do go there, take your vo- take my voice with you and, and boo him for me. <laughs> Won't have a voice left. <laughs> uh, Brian Daigle, member for 40 months, says, big up brothers and everyone in the chat. This is a must win with both teams playing attacking football. We must be ruthless and take our chances. Hashtag Levy out. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to disagree with it being a must win. Mm-hmm. But I do... I do still agree with you with what you were saying in the build-up to this game in the, a couple of days ago, saying it's a must-not lose more than a must-win. Yeah, but in a weird way, you know, we were talking to Dan Dan Bardo again. He was saying how he feels like a point is a better result for Villa than it is for Spurs, and I actually still agree with that in a weird way, because because that point still keeps a five-point gap, but it's just the fact that a loss would be so so disastrous for Spurs will be a, a loss a, um, a loss for Spurs will be more disastrous than a loss for Villa so that's why I would still take a draw even though a draw he, you could argue would still would be a better result for Villa than it would be for Spurs considering it consolidates the five point gap mm. I feel like Aston Villa though like they've got they've got a much harder and I know we've got that run of um Newcastle away City at home Liverpool away and Arsenal at home mm. but even in spite of that I feel like Villa have got a much harder um, end to the season from now until the end. You're looking at that next few games. West Ham away, they've just come back into the form. Uh, that won't be an easy game. Wolves at home, a derby, that's not going to be an easy game, particularly the way the Wolves play um, against uh, teams like an Aston Villa. Man City away up next, Arsenal away. Um, you know, they've got very difficult games coming up over their next three or four games. Yeah, and the difference could be as well, with, with our tough games, we've got Arsenal and City both at home, which... Mm. Even though we we've um, they're very look diff- most difficult games, no guarantees we get anything. We do usually get ourselves up for those games, and we do so- a lot more more often than not we get a result in those games. Yeah. To be honest, and they've got Arsenal and City both away, and more often than not they usually tend to lose those games. So, like if I just isolate our toughest games, I back us to get more points in Villa in their toughest games. But I do think like regardless of the really tough games that we do have. I feel like if we win the games that we're supposed to win again mm. in the games that we're favourites to win this season from now until the end of the season, I do think we get top four. Yeah, I think it's, but I do think it's important come that hard one. If we're above Villa before the Newcastle game, that would be very, very important. I think we will be, mm. even if we draw this game. Mm. Um, another members chat from KPV member for 12 months saying, big up Ben and Sim. Hope you are good. Time for Romero to avenge Ben Tancourt and injure Matty Cash. Come on you Spurs. We have to win on Sunday. Um, but let's get into the predicted lineup. And has been speaking in the press conference. What is the injury news coming in to this game? Yeah, so really positive news on Pedro Porro. He is trained this week and he's back and available. So hopefully he will be playing um, on the weekend. Richarlison is still not training with the squad and he remains unavailable. And he said the remaining long term absentees, Solomon, Sesto, and Forza, still um, uh, have rehab, still undergoing rehab. So all unavailable uh, for this weekend but really positive news on Pedro Porro yeah I think he's going to be a massive plus coming into this weekend especially his just ability on the ball is just like 10 times what it is for Emerson Royale albeit Emerson did have a really good game last time out against Crystal Palace but um, you know it's going to we're going to need different sets of um, tools this weekend against Aston Villa but let's look at the lineup 4-3-3 as per usual in goal is going to be a Vicario yeah and uh He's look with Villa's uh, the way they like to play. They want to get Watkins involved. They're going to get him in behind. I do hope that Vicario is on his on his bike of this one, sweeping, making sure Watkins isn't getting too involved. I do expect quite a busy day for Vicario, knowing how we many chances we tend to concede. So if he is basically able to stop more shots than Emi Martinez, that can go a long way to deciding who and who wins this game. Yeah, absolutely. And um, two of the leading goalkeepers again. As much as we spoke about the strikers, it's two of the leading goalkeepers mm. in the Premier league going head to head this weekend as well right back like we mentioned pedro porro will be there and um i mean his ability the ball is going to be so valuable for us yeah absolutely delighted to have him back and i think it's such an important game for him to return to as well i think his ball playing ability uh could be proved really really vital in this game considering how um villa like to squeeze the pitch a lot so having a player who's able to play in those tight spaces a bit more than emerson it's going to be really really positive but he's got to make sure that defensively he's not getting caught out and i'm sure he will because i think he's improved a lot defensively this season Right centre-back, Kuti Romero is going to have to watch himself after that death stare he gave Matty Cash on, at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium earlier on in this season. And is that a worry for you? 
Maybe. Uh, I, look, I, there's remains to be seen where the cash definitely starts. Is it also... Uh, you know, you remember the, the game back at Villa, um, back at the Tottenham Stadium in October. Although we lost two one, and Watkins gave us a really tough time in that game, we didn't have Romero or Van de Ven in that game. We got to remember Emerson and Van Davis were both playing, so it'll be interesting yeah. to see how Romero and Van de Ven get on with Watkins, as opposed to Davis or Emerson, who Watkins fancied his chances of um, really bullying. So Romero's got to make sure there ain't no bullying happening on Sunday. Yeah, and uh, and you mentioned in the preview how important it is to stop those passing lanes to Ollie Watkins, and mm. Romero is going to be vital to that, isn't he? Absolutely. Um, next up, Mickey van der Ven, left centre back. And I spoke about Romero being vital, stepping in to block those passing lanes. Van der Ven is going to be vital in the Rose recovery runs when uh, they're trying to play Ollie Watkins in behind. Yeah, because I actually look at Villa and you know the, the, their ability to find Watkins in behind is absolutely phenomenal. They they tend to find him in behind so often. And I, I even the goal I saw against um, Luton on the weekend, just a very quick pass from Douglas Ruiz, a quick free kick, and there you go. So Van de Ven's going to be absolutely crucial watching um, where Watkins is running to and making sure he doesn't run in behind because he's such a threat. And uh, if anyone can stop him, then I think Van de, Ven's, Van, de Ven, Van de Ven definitely can. Absolutely. Who's having a better season, Van de Ven or Romero? I think you have to say Van de Ven just because Van de Ven hasn't had really a bad game. And Romero had, did get sent off in a, a, one of the games, didn't he? So you, I think performance level in a weird way, performance level when they are good, probably Romero. But as a, as a consistently st uh, stable performer, probably Van de Ven. Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Let us know in the comment section below. Who do you think is having a better season, Van de Ven or Kuti? Left back, Destiny Udogi is obviously going to start in that game. Um, and again, I, I don't think he's been performing at his best over the last couple of weeks, but still a consistent performer. Yeah, but I think if he can, look, we've seen him <clears throat> up against Salah. We saw him up against Saka earlier in the season. And, you know, he was really up to the challenge. And if he can go a long way to keeping Leon Bailey quiet in this game, that goes a long way to keeping Aston Villa quiet as well. I know, look, he's not their only threat, but... I, I see Leon Bailey and the amount of times they just feed the ball to him and he's able to do a trick and get get free down that right-hand side and it forces opportunities. He's a really big um, uh, attacking threat for Aston Villa this season. He's been exceptional. Uh, I think I think it's like six goals and six assists or something. He's like getting a lot of goal contributions. So if a doggy can have him on lockdown, that can really help stop Aston Villa springing on us in the transition and it can help maybe sustain attacks against them because he's been so good in the transitions for them. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned a doggy against these uh, top wingers and yeah, you're right. He's uh, stood up to the challenge every time, but there has been moments maybe at the start of games in the first 10, 20 minutes where he has come under massive pressure and then he's kind of overcome those and then grown into the game. And with Villa maybe coming out the traps really fast, that's something a doggy has to watch out for massively. Yeah, let's just hope early on he doesn't get overruled by the occasion. Yeah. So that is the back line. Let's move in to the midfield. And in the number six, we're going to go for Eve Bissouma, um, who had a massive, uh, massive uptick in form in the last game. I thought it was his best performance probably since those first 10 games of the season. And we're going to need that and then some probably this weekend. Yeah, he was another player who was missing the, ga uh, the game at the Tottenham Stadium early in the season. Um, obviously, Bentenko actually came into the team, played the six and was actually brilliant in those first 20 minutes. Then he went off injured. But hopefully Bissouma can really um, be confident in this game because that midfield uh, is so aggressive from um, Aston Villa. You've got Louise McGinn, uh, no Kamara, but pr um, probably um, Tielemans uh, potentially as well. So they, they have players who really like to get their, uh, get stuck in, always aggressive, always really intense. And so Basuma is going to have a big job. If we're going to be able to play through them, then it's a lot of it is going to be on Basuma to make sure he's not losing the ball in any silly situations. He's not turning the ball over and he's able to progress the ball um, forward without uh, giving it away. So he's got a crucial role to play here. Are you worried a bit about Basuma? Because we've seen sometimes this season when he does come up against potentially aggressive midfields that he can also um, give it back, get sent off, uh, pick up these needless bookings. I mean, he's got previous to that. Yeah, I guess. Um, and he hasn't been in the best form. So I'm not I'm not saying I'm, I'm worried about him, but I, I, I think... It is a bit of a concern that uh, he hasn't returned to his best form yet, but hopefully this can uh, mark the turn of it. Let's hope so. Um, in the number eight position, we're going to side with R Rodrigo Bentancur. Uh, Pape Sar, as Ange said, is still nursing that back injury, so we expect Rodrigo Bentancur to start this game. 
And what a story it would be for him after getting injured against Aston Villa and coming back and putting his uh, best performance since then. Yeah, obviously he did uh, start last game, did go off after I think an hour, looked quite disappointed with his performance to give away the free kick. which Smashing led to, uh, the boot on the floor, wasn't he? Yeah, and it, that was following the free, giving away that free kick, which led to uh, Palace's opener. But the reason we are signing with uh, siding with Ben Takori is because these, these are Andrew's quotes on Saar on his... Um, on potentially uh, this back issue, he said uh, he's been dealing with it. It's getting better, but it's not totally free. So it's something we're working on with him. It doesn't stop him training, but it does restrict him. From what I understand, he'll be fine. So I think he's saying, you know, long term, he is going to be fine. But for the time being, it's something he's still dealing with. I don't, I, it sounds like he's going to be available, but maybe not available to start. Maybe it's better to have him on the bench for this one. So I think Bentancourt will um, continue. And let's really hope that this form starts to turn for him. I do think it was a general improvement against Palace but obviously you saw himself he was still very very disappointed so uh, hopefully a really good opportunity to to turn his form around and then to make up that midfield three it's obviously going to be James Madison who I thought was brilliant um, in the game last weekend Palace and I still think there's a lot more to come from James. Yeah and he's going to be crucial because that link up with Sonny um, is going to be so so important in this game another player as well who didn't play the game against Villa last time out who could be really crucial I remember Lacelso. I think he scored didn't he mm. and he was uh, played quite a good game but I'm just imagining if Madison can kind of get any sort of foothold in the game and he is allowed to kind of start to dictate it it's going to be very hard for Villa to deal with him so I think he could be the difference in terms of uh, um, having that bit of magic or uh, getting snuffed out on the right wing we are going to look at Dejan Kulusevski there is a case for Brendan Johnson this weekend I think Andrew has been speaking about that situation in his press conference as well but Brendan came on did a really good job last week Kulusevski you know had an all right game in his own right as well um, but we are siding with Decky. Yeah, he was talking about Brennan and whether Brennan is giving him um, difficult decisions to make. He said, I don't know about difficult decisions. They're easy decisions. The good thing about Brennan is he's contributing overall his year. This year, we've seen him grow in, in playing in a, in a different way. They're all in there in front of me with the opportunity to start or not to start. So he seems happy with Brennan. The reason I think we're siding uh, with Kulu is just because... If we had a front three, which we're intending, you know, of just speedsters with no one who's able to get the ball into feet and hold on to it, especially against a very aggressive Villa side who we know uh, every opportunity are going to be trying to nick the ball back and trying to transition us. I think if we had a front three of players who are just, um, you know, fast in behind and not looking to control the ball, we, we're at risk of the of the ball just keeping coming back to us and no ability to get a foothold and control the game I think Kulusevski allows us that element of uh, giving the ball give, having an outlet to actually hold on to the ball and bring other players into the game so I think Kulusevski has to start and look if it does go wrong he could always put him back in the centre and bring Brennan on I'm sure the plan will be to bring Brennan on in the second half anyway but uh, I think at the start we'll go with Kulusevski and then obviously in the number 9 position we will be going for Hyung Min Son who does give this team that X factor absolutely uh, one of the most if not the most clinical strikers in the Premier League at this current moment in time and when a, when a chance falls to him you just know where it's going yeah and it's going to be crucial obviously in the game earlier in the season he had a hat-trick of offside goals three great finishes but um, all, all unfortunately offside and let's hope in this uh, in this game the timing of the runs or oh, sorry I would say more the timing of the passes to him can be that little bit sharper and we have players like Madison in there I'm sure it will be so I think He's absolutely crucial. He's the key in this game. If we're going to be able to get the chances against his, this Villa side who do like to play a bit of a high line. And um, I think he was really great in the number nine last week. And let's hope he improves on that in this one. So really, really important game for Sonny. And finally, to make up the final 11 on the left-hand side, Mano Solomon out injured. So it has to be Timo Werner on that left wing. Has Probably his best game in a Spurs shirt last time out against Crystal Palace. Got his first goal as well. So it's time to build on that. Yeah, no, it was a positive display. Obviously, yeah, did get his goal and um, was unlucky not to get an assist as well. Um, I do, I, if they played concert right back, I, I do wa wa worry how much joy he will get in terms of taking him on and be able to beat him. But let's hope he can continue in the form he showed on um, on uh, last week. And as well, when we're hitting them in transition, he can be very, very crucial with his pace. So uh, hopefully another positive performance for Werner. 
All right, well, let's run through that lineup with you guys one more time. In goal is going to be Vicario, right back Pedro Porro, left back Destiny Udogi, Kuti Romero, and Mickey van der Ven as the centre back pairing. Bissouma in the six, Ben Tancourt and Madison in the six and the, and the eight and the tens. Werner on the left, Kulisevsky on the right, with Hyung Min Son, our captain, up top. Sim has gone for 2-1 to Spurs. I have gone for 3-2 to Spurs. Let's get those three points this weekend. Let's give that revenge to Aston Villa that they fully deserve from the last time out at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Sim will be up at Villa Park on the weekend cheering the boys on and you'll have um, Barnaby and Amir in the studio with you for the watch along. So come and join in and uh, tune in to the boys in the studio. Amir does have a fairly poor record, though, in watch-alongs. <laughs> Let's hope he can overturn that this weekend. We lose weekend. this. He's the last watch-along. This is last one. Um, but yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. That is your Match Preview live stream. Like, subscribe, and comment. And as always, come, come on, you Spurs. Spurs.